My name is Marissa Sage. I'm director of the University Art Museum here at NMSU. Thank you to all of you who are here in person and those of you who are here with us online. I just wanted to, before I introduce Dr. Ortega, and Dr. Ortega can then introduce the rest of the panel, I just wanted to read a bit about you. Dr. Emmanuel Ortega, is the Marilyn Thomas Scholar and Assistant Professor in Art of the Spanish Americas at the University of Illinois in Chicago. He's a scholar in residence at the Newberry Library. And as a scholar and a curator, Ortega has lectured nationally and internationally on images of autos de fe 19th century Mexican landscape painting and visual representations of the New Mexico Pueblo's people in Novo, no, Novo Hispanic Francisco Mort, Martyr paintings. Springing from his research interests, Ortega has curated in Mexico and in the United States, leading to this very latest endeavor, our exhibition, Contemporary Exposo, Devotion Beyond Medium. Again, open till December 22nd. <laughs> An essay titled The Mexican Picturesque and Sentimental Nation, a study in 19th century landscape was published by the Art Bulletin in the summer of 2021, and his book project, Visualizing Franciscan Anxiety and the Distortion of Native Resistance, the, domest the Domesticating Mission is under contract with Rutledge. He is a recurring lecturer for Archetopia Foundation for, Deve for Development of the Largest Artist, which is the largest artist residency in Mexico. Thank you so much for being here and all that you've done with this exhibition, Dr. Emanuel Ortega. Thank you everyone um, at the NMSU Art Museum. As I mentioned before, it is one of the hardest working museum crew that I've seen in my life. It's incredible how much you all get, get to accomplish um, with a couple of people and stuff. And of course, everybody else. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Jasmine, Courtney, Lynn, everybody. Um, thank you for this opportunity. But I wanted to start um, before I introduce our guests, I wanted to start with a quick note in relation to ideas of the border. Because one of the things that as a curator I was attempting to do with this exhibition is to do a Latinx art show without being about Latinx stuff, sort of like the fantasies of Latinx. So if you will indulge me for a couple minutes, I wanted to read an introduction to some of these ideas. Gloria Saldúa in Borderlands, La Frontera, the New Mestiza, reflects on the condition of existing in the borderlands. She mentions, quote, whenever two or more cultures edge each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under lower, middle, and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy, end of quote. Further, historian Anna Nasser notes how Saldúa defines border people by, quote, being in and in between state by their difference and abnormality that is constantly highlighted and punished for not conforming to the dominant culture and their culture, end of quote. Any conception of the border that is the state of existence, quote unquote, in between, a clear place of boundaries between two realities, a political demarcation that defines two identities. In short, any reference to a static state, place and condition that rests on the same binary that historically sought to erase its unsettling realities must be put into question. As these notions emerge, their conceptualization seems ironically and pun intended, a bit one-sided. Namely, it is through US academic circles that the binary fantasy of the border has emerged and thrive. As such, we need to recontextualize historical notions of the frontier outside fantasies of the frontera. And in order to understand the lineage of implications that the edges of empire have represented for those who cannot conceive them, that is, for those who fear it and for whom it continues to exist. The ideological bloodline of the border between the US and Mexico, for instance, has less to do with our liminal mestizo, mestiza, mestiza fantasies as articulated by Ansaldúa than with colonial Puritan conceptions of the wilderness. Art historian Kirsten Pye Buick defined the wilderness as follows. Like the concept of progress, Puritans and their descendants had a deep connection with the idea of wilderness. And we need to deal with the idea of the wilderness in its old sense 
in order to understand the ideology of the frontier. She continues, the wilderness was the home of Indians, witches, as well as the devil. It was disorienting, literally bewildering, a space that could turn men of God into the very entities that they were born to contest, end of quote. The edges of empire have always fluctuated, their political boundaries ever shifting and their religious and moral significance always at a state of emergency. From the expansion of the Spanish borders into the Caribbean of the Americas in the late 15th century to the Godstein Purchase of 1854, the political frontiers of empires have warped the Southwest into what it is today. They have never stopped changing. It was taught, I was taught to always enact dynamic, dynamic language in the articulation of it all. In my classes, for instance, we don't speak of identity, but we contextualize identification. We don't speak of race nor class, but instead we learn about the process of racialization and classification that have affected North America for more than five centuries. As such, we organize this panel to actively engage in conversations where the idea of the border ceases to be a liminal fantasy in the articulation of identity with the purpose of exposing the ongoing processes of the borderization, fronterization of our lands and what they have represented for Native Americans and all of those who have found ourselves contesting its limits due to the ever shifting face of frontier. Without said, I want to introduce our panelist, Ed Gomez, who is joining us from California. He is an artist, curator, and educator located in Los Angeles, California. His academic research includes border art, alternative art, exhibition platforms, and concepts revolving around identity and border politics. He is currently an associate professor of art at California State University, San Bernardino, and specializes in art and technology with an emphasis on 3D software, fabrication, digital art, border art, and Chicanx art. Professor Gomez currently serves on the advisory committee of the Chich Marin Center for Chicano Art and Culture in the Riverside Art Museum. In 2006, he confounded the Mexicali Biennium, a binational art and music program addressing the region of the US-Mexico border for which he's currently a director and co-president. We also have from Ciudad Juarez, Christian Diego Diego. He graduated in visual arts in 2007 from the Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juarez. He dedicates himself to cultural management and teaching. He was a member of the VIAAC Collective and has collaborated with the Secretaría de Cultura del Estado de Chihuahua for the Border Book Fair and with Alas y Raíces for Creative Summers. He served as coordinator for the Bachelors of Visual Arts at the WASJ or UAZJ, and since March 2019, directs the Museo de Arte de Ciudad Juarez, which is part of the IMBAL, National Networks of Museum. He's a member of the Linking Council of the Council of the Municipality of Ciudad Juarez, the Network of Museums and Cultural Centers of Juarez, the Desert Mountain Time by National Network Urban Skill Program. He coursed the diploma in executive training for cultural and museum leaders from the Instituto de Liderazgo en Museos AC and the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City and is currently pursuing a master's degree in cultural development at the Centro de Postgrados del Estado de México. From Albuquerque, we have J, um, Jose, um, Josie, sorry, Josie Lopez. She is the head curator of art at the Albuquerque Museum, where she curated Inedible Blue, Indigo Across the Globe, The Printer's Proof, and The Carved Line, Block Printmaking in New Mexico. Currently, she's working on organizing upcoming traveling exhibitions for the museum and curating current and upcoming exhibitions featuring a broad range of art, historical, and contemporary themes. Lopez oversees the museum's collections and the permanent exhibition Common Ground, entitled Common Ground Art in New Mexico. Prior to the cultural curatorial position at the Albuquerque Museum, Lopez curated Puerto Rico Defying Darkness, Currency, What Do You Value? and specialized in species and peril along the Rio Grande at 516 Arts. Lopez completed an BA in history and the master's in teaching at Brown University. She completed her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. 
Her dissertation explored printmaking in 19th century Mexico, Spain, and France. Lopez's research and curatorial interests include examining art as a discursive agent in the political arena, the intersections of art and the environment, modern and contemporary Latin American art, and the history of Mexican and New Mexican art. As the 2013-2015 Eleanor Tufts Fellow at MSMU, she taught courses on modern Mexico and the Prince of Francisco Goya, and she has also taught the courses on the history of printmaking and European art at the University of New Mexico. From Juarez in El Paso, we have Edgar Picasso Merino. He is the founding co-director of the nonprofit Azul Arena Organization, as well as the editor-in-chief of the magazine under the same name. His work focuses on the ethical representation of border issues through arts and culture. He has worked on a number of projects as producer, project manager, and visual artist. Picasso has also collaborated with major, major institutions and organizations in El Paso Juarez border region, such as the Rubens Center for the Visual Arts, El Paso Museum of Art, the Women and Gender Studies Department at UTEP, Instituto Municipal de las Mujeres, among others. He has also worked with many local and international artists, such as Lara Turón, Heidi Alonso, Resiste, Minerva Cuevas, Rafael Lozano Hemer, Gaku Tsutaja, and many others. He recently began writing for Hyperallergic and Southwest Contemporary magazines. And I'm going to show um, a couple of images um, for our next for our next guest. I don't know if you can see them. Can, can somebody give me a thumbs up? Okay, good. So we have Carrie Doyle. She is the director of the, let me go to the first one. She's the director of the Rubin Center for the Visual Arts at the University of Texas at El Paso. She specializes in curatorial projects that are interdisciplinary, participatory, and performative, with a special focus on the border as subject and site. Doyle regularly collaborates with Doyle, I'm sorry, collaborates with individuals and institutions from both El Paso and Ciudad Juarez in the execution of a wide range of her interdisciplinary and community-engaged programming. She has curated and organized original exhibitions, commissions, and performances by international artists, including Tomás Saraceno, Tania Candiani, Regina Jose Galindo, Teresa Margolles, Máximo González, Juan Antonio Vega, Rafael Lozano Hemer, Minerva Cueva, and many, many others. She was a fellow at the Smithsonian Latino Institute in 2009, at the Getty Institute for Museum Leadership in 2014. She holds a BA in Political Science from the Paul University Chicago, and a BA in Drawing and Printmaking, and an MA in Border Studies from UTEP. Thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for um, indulging me in this sort of long um, ideas that I've been thinking about in relationship to the border. So with that said, I wanted to, I want us to start thinking about precisely that, the ways in which we engage traditionally, we have traditionally and culturally we have engaged with the border. So my first question follows, as curators on the Southwest borderlands, how does your practice, the center romantic ideas of the border that continue to exploit the trauma of those most affected by it? And I guess we can, anybody can raise their hand and maybe anybody can start answering this question. Um, there's really not a model. There's no like you get two minutes or two minutes. So we'll just start into a conversation like that. Well, I, I can begin if it's okay. Um, I, um, hi everyone, thanks for uh, the invitation and for being here. Um, a few years ago when I began doing artistic and cultural work in the, in the border, um, I started with like a very clear idea that I wanted to change the border narrative. I like, was tired of seeing all these images that were coming out uh, being replicated of like, you know, like violent stuff and, you know, terrible stuff happening and not just through art, but also like, you know, through journalism and through um, academia even. Um, 
and my goal was to like you know like show a different part of what the border is and it was like a very curious like you know like a uh, process because as i kept working more and more with artists that are actually living in Juarez or in El Paso that are creating con great contemporary work, I realized that um, the problem is not so much like you know, talking about these issues, but, how, who, but more who gets to talk about them and how they get talked about. And I feel like um, one of the ways that I try to like, you know, uh, uh, think about these like, you know, like ideas of like, you know, what, when, when are you falling into exploding somebody's pain through art? Um, I think the most important thing is to keep incorporating the local voices of people that actually have the lived experience of the border into these places, you know, and, and you really can't tell them, you know, don't talk about violence, don't talk about, you know, like um, all these uh, negative issues if it, if it affects them and you have to give them a voice. And that's what I learned to understand. And, and, and doing that, I think, you know, like art with more nuances that do talk about all these hardships come out and is being created, but in a way that becomes like a little bit more ethical. But um, that's just like a small uh, process that I went through and wanted to share, yeah. Mm -hmm. And jumping off of that, I think um, a project that I worked on at when I was um, at 516 Arts uh, called Species in Peril along the Rio Grande. Um, we really wanted to try to break the curatorial model that, that we had been utilizing to do exhibitions, particularly around the environment. And we created a collaboration with Subankar Banerjee at the University of New Mexico. And we actually had these, this incredible series. We, we had about eight artists, I think, that were participating in that particular project. But what we did is we created a series of meetings where we all came together and we actually read these scientific studies around what was happening in the environment around the Rio Grande. And then we, so we had this like common ground about this scientific work that we were all sort of engaging in. And then each of the artists went off and kind of came up with their proposals based on these discussions and these readings that we had all done together. And that's kind of how the exhibition came together. So it was less of us trying to find images of people who were depicting animals along the Rio Grande and more about how were artists taking these studies and turning them into stories. So in a lot of way, it gave them the agency to then interpret what was happening along the border in terms of the broader living world, not just humans, but the land and the animals who are also there. And I think by concentrating on a particular issue like that, it allowed us to dive a little bit deeper into also what the human impacts were without necessarily romanticizing, you know, what was happening in terms of the, the negative impacts of what we see on the border. Ed? Great, right, thank you. I think um, for me also, I think it's just simply listen to your to your audience, your community, you know, your artists that you're working with. Um, so as not to dictate a specific or impose a specific curatorial structure or narrative that's not welcomed in the community. Um, the only way we've been able to sustain our curatorial practice in the borderlands is to kind of build relationships with our communities, find ways in which everybody can benefit from these cultural exchanges that we produce. Um, and create op art opportunities on both sides of the border. And I think this community building uh, strategy starts by listening first instead of dictating and then building relationships uh, through collaborations, which has been really successful, We've been really successful with that. Um, I think another curatorial practice that we, we like to employ is the non-fee based open call process for submitting proposals. I think this process is, is merit-based and it's not dependent upon uh, recommendations from commercial gallerists, collectors, or curators, or even cultural institutions that often recycle the same roster of artists over and over again for specific agendas. I think some of the artists that we've worked with are not considered part of the academy, um, but have sustained uh, art practice regardless of commercial success or international recognition. I think those, those are two key points or two key practices that I think that are really important for us. Uh, and then this pro process was also really uh, uh, essential during the last two years when we've been locked down and everything's been having to pivot and transform or, or transition to something that's online. 
Uh, we currently have uh, our next iteration of the biennial that's open at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History titled The Land of Milk and Honey, uh, which most, most of it was programmed during uh, COVID with virtual studio visits and online submissions. Uh, which was very challenging. Uh, but the Land of Milk and Honey explores uh, artists' views around multi-layered topics associated with agriculture, including environmental impacts, cultural culinary traditions, identity, migration, regional histories, uh, and familial and mythical connections to food. Well, um, I'm going to uh, respond my, in Spanish because it's my language. And, Históricamente, eh, Ciudad Juárez ha tenido como esta cuestión de que su narrativa ha sido siempre contada por terceros, en una cuestión más como extractivista y en una cuestión que siempre eh, como que la comunidad eh, artística y cultural no hablaba, ¿no? o no, no tenía la necesidad de hablarlo porque pues vivía dentro de este contexto. Y a partir de eso, pues también este, toda la necesidad de, de generar una narrativa a partir de lo que era vivir en Juárez o el contexto en Juárez, pues comentaba, ¿no? O iniciaba con una cuestión que tenía que ver con, primero, una aceptación de la realidad. Pues a partir de esto, este, eh, últimamente los artistas ya se han visto como, con más necesidad de apropiarse de su propia historia, de generar obra y generar eh, propuestas artísticas a partir de estas narrativas. Eh, cuestiones curatoriales, yo en mi caso, pues yo al ser director de museo, yo me baso mucho también en, 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 en el trabajo de, de, de artistas y de curadores, y en el caso también que depende eh, este espacio de intervenciones curatoriales que se pueden reafianzar eh, con mi perspectiva, eh, pues podría comentar, ¿no? Ahorita el, este espacio trata de, de generar estas, estas propuestas de exhibición, perdón, de exhibición, en la que se, el ojo clínico de, del artista o de las personas que están creando algo está lo más cercano a, a, al concepto, ¿no? De, vaya, y creo que esto es algo muy importante. La curaduría también depende mucho de, de la visión del curador. Y también tenemos que entender que el artista, o en este caso la exhibición que estamos trabajando ahorita, que igual y ahorita les puedo compartir unas imágenes, eh, es la visión completamente de inmigrante, ¿no? Entonces, ahí entre menos se vea el toque curatorial, creo que es lo más honesto que se puede hacer. Entonces, eso creo que también no es tanto descentralizar, no es tanto romantizar, sino más bien eh, realizar, ¿no? O sea, estar completamente aterrizados en la realidad en la que estamos. Y creo que eso es más honesto que todo lo demás. And I just want to kind of echo um, what Diego said and also sort of give him credit for some of the things that are happening over at the museum in Ciudad Juarez, because one of the tensions I think on the border is this kind of idea of whether or not you deal with these issues of violence and migration and things like that or turn away from them. Sometimes there's sort of this kind of uh, maybe false binary that you're going to do one or the other, right? And so in a place like Museo de Ciudad Juarez, um, the Diego over time, what he's done is sort of engaged artists in themes that are of interest to the general public. So I'm thinking most recently of a series of show he did with women artists in Juarez, where they dealt with some of these issues. They dealt with issues of violence, but they also dealt with issues of, you know, neoliberal development in Juarez and industrialization and people forming collectives. And so the, the project becomes um, much more nuanced while at the same time not turning away from the issues at hand. And, and I think that's similar to what Edgar said as well. So when you begin to involve um, local artists' voices in these projects, um, you get a much more nuanced and complex read on the reality. So we work a lot with international artists and we're very committed to doing that because we're one of the few spaces in our region that are bringing in international artists from other places. But we're always balancing that with an audience who definitely doesn't want to have another mediated version of the border regurgitated, you know by an artist who comes from somewhere else and who can only read like sort of above the surface. So it's this constant balance between, I think, you know, respecting the kind of um, talent and trajectory that some of the international artists bring in, but finding ways to involve local voices and then support local artists in um, responses that end up being, again, much more complex and much more nuanced than, than what we're able to get from people who come from other places. But. What I'm hearing from everybody is the importance, as um, Edgar is saying, the lived experience, partnerships with artists, 
And I like this idea of almost like the invisible curatorial approach to curating that Diego just mentioned to allow for an honest conversation around some of these ideas to think of a new dialogue surrounding this, this partnerships. Thank you, everyone. So <clears throat> my following question has a lot to do with a what I see a recurring practice in a lot of um, oh, before I continue, Marisa, do you want to add anything to, to this? I think I would just actually echo many of the sentiments that were already spoken about. Um, and I will also say that I think a big part of what almost all of us do, and Josie, this might have been a um, you know, desert or mountain time, which many of us are part of in different ways, um, which is a collective of institutions from Colorado down to Ciudad Juarez. Um, and we're, we're talking about going over Ed, so who knows? Um, you know, really sprung from a lot of us institutions working in this very similar fashion, really making sure that we're listening to the voices that exist within our communities when we're inviting artists in who will create works. Uh, and I was talking about this earlier with Paula, who uh, uh, potentially our communities can really be a part of and, and can be part of that that conversation that's so important to many of these artists. So our artists impact impact upon our communities and our communities impact upon our artists. And there's this reciprocality that I think many of us are part of within our institutions that allows for experimentation, um, really, really um, layered conversations um, and not and nuanced views of what you're speak, what what we're all speaking about here. Uh, there's there's not these very very strong binaries. Rather, I think a lot of us as institutions are trying to just set up different ways of asking these kind of questions without this is the answer or this is the view or really just setting these questions up. Thank you so much, Marisa. And sorry for that oversight. I apologize. So as um, there's there seems to be like a curatorial practice that we see in a lot of museums as a consequence to the pandemic, to the Black Lives Matter movements, that there's there's a there's a nationwide reckoning with issues of race, class, um, and gender. And um, one of the things that I've noticed in a lot of spaces is the ways in which historical violences are addressed via the uh, approaching contemporary practices from, from people of color mainly, almost as if the artists of colors are going to erase some of the violences that the same museums are either part of historically or they're trying to um, expose. So my question is the following, as a conse consequence, as a consequence to the Black Lives Matters movement in 2020, there has been a reckoning with the ways in which museums deal with violences associated with colonization and imperial expansion. Have you seen a demand on behalf of your visitors or, or the, the, the work or the artists you work with to expand upon this history? That's the first part of the question. And the second part, what do you think is the best course of action in delineating an anti-colonial agenda that does not involve the absolution of those who may feel implicated with this past? I can start. Josie. Uh, we had um, a somewhat complex situation at our museum because we um, on our museum campus, it's it's not a monument that belongs to the museum, but it's part of City of Albuquerque's public art. But we actually have a, um, I think what Nick Estes called a monument to settler colonialism on our doorstep. And so um, we did have some major protests. There was um, sort of a taking down of a statue of Oñate. Um, that ended up having some violent repercussions. Um, and in many ways, the museum was impacted, even though it was much more of an issue around 
the city of Albuquerque and how they were dealing with the monument, we still got a lot of the, the blowback from that situation. But what ended up happening is we had a lot of different ways of thinking about it. We're still dealing with it because it has to actually be a city council decision with whatever happens to that monument. But it spurred all kinds of, I think, interesting and productive conversation within our museum itself, because here we were directly dealing with settler colonialism in a way that was impacting our communities. And, and it's a really long story, so I'm not going to get into it. But one of the things that I learned from that whole process was something that our um, indigenous communities actually brought to the table. And what we noticed is that a lot of our indigenous communities were not engaging in these conversations that we were having around the, the project. And part of that was because they see themselves as sovereign nations. And so that conversation had to be done on a government to government basis. It wasn't about community dialogue. So what ended up happening through these dialogues is that we found that the struggle, the, the strife, the, the argument was actually within the Latino community itself. It was the Hispanos who were really offended that we were taking down the statue and the Chicanos who were upset that there was a statue of Oñate to begin with. And to, to, to realize that, you know, again, getting back this idea, there's not a monolithic Latino culture, especially in New Mexico and in, certainly in El Paso and certainly along the border. And so to see that this battle was happening within the Latino community was something that has changed the way that I think about our audiences and who those audiences are and the projects that we are embarking upon to try to expand the view of what Latinx, Latino, Chicano, Mexican American, Hispano, Nuevo Mexicano, what do all of those things mean in terms of um, New Mexicans and how they see themselves related to the lands that we inhabit? Does anybody else want to um, address some of these ideas? I was just going to say, um, being a university art museum, um, but then also like being again one of the uh, major institutions in an area that's very has very little artistic infrastructure. I think one of the ways that we have attempted to address this over the years, both pre and post, you know, pandemic, is um, by training arts professionals. You know, and I think that you know part of that started with our students in our museum studies program and in our. Um, internship program and so you know some of those people go other places so we're really proud of like Andres Payan who's at Contemporary Craft, um, Carolina Franco at Site Santa Fe, Arely Rocha who's at NYU right now like those are people who came from our program who were given opportunities to really be engaged at a very young age but also we're taking a lot more seriously our relationship to local artists and I think that's partially through the voices of local artists speaking back to us through our projects so you know we've always engaged local artists as paid producers in our projects and we've always Always tried to make meaningful connections and I believe that's the role of the institution really is to be a permanent connection with the community so when artists come in and out you know we have a context but um through uh, through the a big project that we did uh with Rafael Lozano Hammer that Edgar was very involved in um border tuner you know we we got a really clear message back that you know the most important thing for local artists is have money to do the work that they want to do about about the place that they live in. And so um, you know, we were able to start a fund called the Transborder Art Fund, which I'm happy to say no longer lives under the Rubin Center, but is independent and is well funded through the Mellon Foundation to give funds to local artists. And then we're also looking at how do we incorporate local artists into professional positions inside of our institution without requiring them to take the traditional path of you know necessarily leaving the city going to a phd program coming back sort of looking at what are these sort of what are the kind of um local intelligence that people bring what are the sort of things that people have learned from just being an artist in this place and how do you find a meeting point between the institution and and practices um, that have already been happening in the community with very little resources and very little infrastructure how do you find a meeting point between those two and it's not sort of asking someone to you know, transform their practice into an institutional practice, but sort of the institution meeting them halfway. So I think for us, um, you know, we don't have a lot of kickback from our audience in general, but we've had a lot of critique, I think, from artists over the years, and we've tried to hear that and, um, and incorporate that in some ways. And as an institution, we're only 15 years old, but to grow, you know, in that and, and, and learn about, I think for us, those practices have more to do with funding and capacitating local voices than it does with what happens on our walls or, or in our spaces. So, yeah. 
Were you going to say something, Edgar? Um, no. Well, I mean, my um, I don't necessarily run a space uh, with an audience, but I have uh, been part of projects that have to incorporate a lot of different voices and a lot of like a lot of, that become a platform to work like work with a big group of people, and in thinking about you know like who to work with and the selection of people that you know you incorporate into the projects, I feel like. Um, in Juarez and El Paso recently, there's been like a movement, I want to say, you know, like more like, you know, female voices are being incorporated. Um, uh, for example, I was part of this um, perform, uh, performing arts project um, at the momentary this past year, and we had to incorporate like six or se seven different performers. And we did like a very diverse group of people, you know, like from like super young to like, you know, like elders. Uh, we had like a black Chicana woman there. We had like a dancer. We had like a poet. So like it's just a matter of taking a lot of, you have to go the extra step to make sure that you're incorpor incorporating different voices into the stuff that you're doing, like whether it's like curating or whether it's, you know, producing a show or um, publishing a magazine. Um, it's still pretty easy to just, you know, run with like the first things that come, like the first artists that come up, you know, like in your radar, you know, like you're like white males that are really good at, you know, like pushing or putting themselves out there. But I think like if we're going to be running spaces or projects, um, it has to be part of like our ongoing decision making process to incorporate these voices and look for them a little bit more. Know that we have to like even like maybe we're not going it's to, it's not going to be an easy thing to even incorporate these voices because it's like maybe people that are coming from like different practices or different ideas of, you know, looking at art or looking at artistic practice, practices. but it's pretty important that we keep on doing it like I mean often and it becomes part of like what we make um, as uh, gestores I guess producers yeah thank you Edgar um alguien más quiere agregar algo does anybody else want to add anything else I mean, I can I can jump in, but I think I think for us it's um it's if we're coming from this from a little bit of a different perspective or position because we are nomadic, um, we're a small arts organization. We we go dormant from time to time in between big projects. But I think it's um I think institutions make mistakes, curators make some mistakes, um, and I think maybe having some flexibility and listening to the to the community and correcting when when these mistakes do happen and being able to have the fortitude and the understanding um, that you can't cover all the bases and, and you people and institutions inevitably get things wrong but I think it's important to correct those once they're once they're addressed and brought up and, um, and I think social media is, is a great way to kind of get that feedback whether it's a positive or negative feedback and I think that having that flexibility as an institution to be able to to um, identify things and then and more importantly not only identify them but make those corrections when they see them Bueno, uh, pues en, en nuestro caso que somos como un museo federal, ¿no? Que, que cumplimos y, y seguimos con cuestiones de ejes este, que tienen una transversalidad y que directamente contienen con temáticas, ¿no? Que a veces van incluidas a partir de, de diferentes este, poblaciones. Eh, pareciera que en un momento dado eh, es como, como se convierte como un checklist, ¿no? De que, oh, hay que cumplir con ciertas eh, características, ciertos, ciertos rigores. Pero más bien nosotros, bueno, lo que vemos no es forzar los proyectos, no es, una, no es, no es que estés forzando el proyecto, si el proyecto nace con una naturaleza en la que los ciertos grupos están involucrados, es ahí donde puede generarse una, una proyección este, tanto positiva como, como artística. Eh, mm. Yo más bien me enfoco mucho en, en cuál es el, el criterio del público, porque pues bueno, también venimos en un contexto donde es, tenemos... Eh, eh, público que ha sufrido de tanto racismo, xenofobia o de cuestiones que tienen que ver con, con ser de afrodescendientes y migrantes, ¿no? Todavía. Entonces, eh, estas cuestiones creo que implican todavía ya este, un contexto extra a partir de, de lo que ya se, sigue, se vive, ¿no? De, de lo que ya se plantea, eh, que podría estar determinado por una naturaleza que está implícita en muchos de los ciudadanos que a veces batallamos para que entendamos que a veces la xenofobia eh, no está bien. Entonces, pues se convierte en todo un desafío, ¿no? Armar proyectos o hasta que podrían llegar a ser 
este, debatibles, ¿no? Hasta para la misma comunidad. Pero ese es el, yo creo que ese es nuestro rol, eh, mediar, mediar, educar un poco y empezar a plantear eh, estas nuevas visiones. Creo que eso es, es parte de lo que nosotros trabajamos e intentamos también. No, no depende completamente de, de un museo, de una galería, plantear esto, sino son políticas que realmente también pues vaya, quedan más grandes que lo que podemos trabajar. El granito de arena. Marisa, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think a big part of, again, what we're all saying is, um, you know, really reaching back in to our communities and listening to our community's voices. Here at NMSU, we're on a Hispanic-serving institution, in a Hispanic-serving institution, in a Hispanic-majority region. Um, and we have to kind of recognize what that means in relationship to our collecting practices, to our exhibitions practices, um, to our programming practices, and really, you know, work to make sure that we're paying people um, and we're incorporating people who are able to articulate and think about and make works about and speak and speak and study and research about ways that we can evolve these conversations. Um, they're difficult, uh, they're not easy to have. We've got to be prepared. I agree very much with Ed that, you know, we're not always going to do it right. A lot of us here at this table and online are working with small staffs um, in, in sometimes small institutions and large institutions. And you've got to be ready to listen and have these conversations that are they shouldn't be easy, right? Like they're, they're intrinsically important to have though. And so how do we make sure that we're uh, working with and paying all the different people who should be really given the platform to help facilitate these conversations in various mediums and various ways? And it's an interesting concept, the idea. Oh, you were you gonna say something, Josie? Just to, to continue on that, I do think, you know, this idea of reckoning that you brought to the conversation, you know, as a sort of medium sized institution, a museum that has collections and, you know, all the trappings that go with what that means. Um, I do think that the reckoning is actually pushing a lot of museums like ours to do a lot of interesting work. So, you know, for example, a lot, out of some of these conversations, we were actually, we had the opportunity to do a demographic analysis of our collections. And using that data-driven model, we now have collections plans that are specifically targeting, you know, diversifying the collections based on, on, on this kind of data. And so I, I think the reckoning is a good thing. I mean, I think it's forcing, institutions to really look at what do we collect, what do we show, what artists, and then, you know, as a result of that demographic analysis, the mayor actually granted our museum $100,000 to purchase work from living Albuquerque artists, you know, so it sends that that message of, you know, again, getting back to what everyone else on the panel is saying is like, how are we supporting our creative communities, how are we supporting artists, And this seemingly, you know, a very institutional kind of project of examining the collections ended up leading to real money going to artists in a real way and bringing their voices into the collections. So, I mean, I guess I'm a little optimistic because I've had the opportunity to, um, to, to do this kind of work. I'm not arguing that every museum has that opportunity, but, you know, sometimes reckoning is, is, a, is a great thing because it's pushing us to do the work that we need to be doing um, to, to address some of the underrepresented communities um, that haven't been present in the past in the museum in a big way. I was just going to say one more thing, if you don't mind just playing off of what Diego said about each of us doing our part, because one of the things that I think is most powerful in our two communities, and I'm here with two of my closest colleagues, Diego and Edgar, but um, is actually seeing a plurality of institutions operating at all different levels. And I think, you know, um, those of us that have sort of more traditional structures, one of the things that we can continue to do in our communities is to support um, emerging institutions and to be collaborative. And because I think when you talk about the complexity of 
um, the issues that we're facing, you know, for us in the borderlands, you know, but um, but I think all across the country and all across the globe, what we really want is a is a plurality of um, ways of responding. So different size institutions, institutions like you know Ed says that are you know that might be nomadic and don't have a building but are doing programming and just you know the I think uh, it's really important to kind of break down sort of these kind of major institutions and to be supporting a whole plurality of platforms of expression that are funded i'm not saying you know you know just sort of pat people in the back and let them do their thing but to really be thinking about how funding and how structure and how we can be collaborative in a way that allows um not just different artistic voices but different platforms and ways of being as institutions or independent organizations we really are at a very specific time in history that you're right josie um reckoning is so important it, it could be like a small window in which actually action could take um and, and thinking about the circles of violence right like where action can take place but it's so interesting to hear from each and one of you because at the end of the day there's so many layers on these institutions and these practices and this is for example one of the things that i always tell my students that while we have a lot of things that we see in the museums or see in galleries we also need to understand who are the main stakeholders of some of these institutions and how to play against or pro some of those um, um, some of those ideas. So it is a very complicated um, a very complicated issue. Marisa, do we have time for one more question? Um, yeah, you could do one more question, then we can take some questions from online and one or two people here. Yes, we do have already a question from somebody on the chat. So we'll, I'll, I'll just ask one more question. Um, this is basically, um, this question came about a lot of conversations that Marisa and I had, especially in relation of being, I, this is, I don't, I don't, I, I try not to use words um, center and periphery, but thinking about quote unquote, the main centers of art and existing outside of those main centers, what is it to be an institution like, and or a artistic practice like the ones you all hold? So with that in mind, how has the mystic um, surrounding the border or how has the mystic of creating in the border benefited or affected the way the rest of the art world um, views your, your practice? Wait, I need you to ask me that again. <laughs> oh, no, no, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> How is it exist? Because we talked about this a lot, where it's like, well, people yeah. think that because I'm in cruises, there's nothing going on right here. Um, there's this idea of being in, in the border that somehow it's not being in New York or being in Berlin or being in Mexico City. Like, what is it about being in the border that affects the procedures of the museum or or the or the practice the curating practice or actually benefits that i think you know over the years for better or for worse and lots of times for worse i mean i'm, I'm proud of all the products that we did but i think we were able to draw a lot of artists that were much bigger than our budget or our profile because there were artists that were interested in making work about the border and so um it's a you know it's a bit of a double-edged sword we, you know, as a small institution with, you know, our original mission was for a student body in a community that doesn't travel much on, on, on balance, you know, so if we had a student studying art uh, with us for four years, they might only see the art that exhibited in the re region. The idea was to bring art and ideas from other places and sort of ironically, the thing that brought people from other places was making art about the place where these students lived and understood better than the artists who were coming in. So that is not to say that we didn't do some projects that I think are really fantastic and that students were able to collaborate with and that we were able to connect with local artists and you know projects that I think were really meaningful on both an artistic and perhaps like a sort of social commentary level. But the tensions between that, you know, existed from the beginning and have gotten bigger over time. And so, you know, as Ed said, you know, as institutions, uh, I don't know if I'd go as far to say that those were mistakes, but it was definitely a, a trajectory of learning. So, you know, we were excited to do these projects. We did have an ethic of sort of pairing up artists who came in from other places with paid producers, you know, here in the region and, you know, tried to balance that out in some way. But there's a tension overall between the work that's being made, but also an audience. The work that was made, you know, I think 
would have shown really well in New York or in LA, and much of it did go on and, and you know, was shown other places. You know, I think it taught other people about the border, but for our audiences who have a lived experience of the border, it wasn't really relevatory work, right? So it was work that sort of replicated uh, this, again, mediated experience of the border that's known by people who live in the border and people who live outside of the border. So, so that tension over time, but it, it's also been a point of great growth for us. I mean, some of the best conversations we have have had from local artists having a critique of that or us feeling the weight of that and trying to address it through, you know, institutional change. And, and so, um, but it, it's been complicated. Um, yeah. And then the other thing that always happens, I, I think this happens to anybody that like works in a university museum or in a museum outside of like New York, LA, Chicago, is you go somewhere and you're like, oh, I work on a, at a university museum in El Paso, Texas, and people's brains go dead. And then they can't hear anything else that you're saying. Like you're just like, rah, 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 rah. they might like catch something like, you know, Teresa Margoyles, well, I think I heard of her, like, you know, something like that, but they, it's just, <laughs> And it kills me and I don't even like, I just am like, I'm from El Paso, Texas as well, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I think another way that it really affects art being produced in the border is, I mean, I mean, talking about like this like centralization of funds and art and everything that's been happening for like, you know, centuries, ever since like, you know, the, um, the colonies and, and, and so there's this, um, lack of understanding of what the place is there's lack of funds like you know like honestly like central governments don't give a shit about you know like what's going on on the border like we get very limited resources we don't have like an infrastructure like for art or for like social growth or for like for anything so i like a dynamic that i feel that ends up happening is that the artists take on roles that become like very socially engaged so you see a lot of art that's being produced that's like you know beyond just producing a piece it's you know like actually like you know working within the community and 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 doing projects with different segments of the community so a lot of the work is informed by these processes and i feel like that creates like a, um like a wave or a movement that i feel like is very strong at the border you know it's like most of the artists that are doing great contemporary work at least in el paso and juarez also have like a very deep social practice like very very like in in, in deeply engaged in their communities at different levels, you know, like environment or like, you know, women's rights or, you know, like immigration, all these things. And it seems like they're, I mean, they're trying to make a difference, but it, like, I mean, but their art really becomes super informed through these practices. And I feel like that, that wouldn't happen if we were not in this like precarious situation, I guess, but. I, I will, oh, sorry, I will say, um, as a born and raised New Yorker, I think a city center is where your community makes it. Um, a, a metropolis or, you know, I'm definitely, I'm not gonna lie. Like, I think I'm a little bit, you know, uh, in the sky about some of these ideas, but I think we're in one of the most important rich, not rich, but rich um, cultural places that is important on so many various levels to the United States and Mexico. And we're at this convergence of so many different um, highways, uh, interstates, um, and conversations that are so important, have such large ripple, ripple effects across the country and globally. And I don't believe that any one place gets to call itself the most important place when it comes to world, really anything. But, you know, I, I just think that it's, a, it's about your community. And it's the same thing I believe about, you know, these ideas that we have now about politics and voting and superstars. And that really, like, you have to care and invest in your community. And you want to bring outside voices in who care and can think about your community. and and vice versa, which I said earlier. And I just, you know, being from this place and, and having been part of the commercial art world, I just have this perspective that there's so much more risk taking here. Um, there's so many, so many really, really depth filled, layered conversations here. There's so much openness. There's so much collaboration. There isn't a person that I feel like I can't just pick up the phone and call in New Mexico some people don't love to have phone conversations, but in general, 
<laughs> Text me, please. <laughs> and Manuel got used to it. <laughs> um, you know, so I just, I, I feel like there's this, um, again, and I know I'm being a little bit optimistic and a little bit starry-eyed, but I do think that there's these conversations that happen here that don't really happen in any place that I've lived in. Um, and I feel so lucky to be able to be here um, and just be a person who can view this in general and view the work that goes on at Kerry Space and at Josie Space and definitely at Diego Space. So yeah, I mean, we, we, we are the center that we choose. The other thing that I think I've been sort of my, my mind around the border is um, constantly shifting. Um, but I've been working on a project um, with Ginger Dunnell, who has a podcast called Broken Boxes Podcast. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that we've been having around these conversations around not necessarily decolonizing, but indigenizing the way that we think about place and land and people and how it's all interconnected and how the border is a political construct. You know, and even here in New Mexico, we have 19 sovereign nations within our political state borders. And so when you start breaking it down like that into sort of a broader timeline where we often think of like statehood and those kinds of things as defining our history. But when you look back thousands of years, who were the people that were here? What was the land that was here? And it did not get defined by the political borders that we currently have. So those have been really um, interesting conversations that have started to, for me as a New Mexican who grew up believing that, you know, both my parents were Atrisco land grant families, thinking that we had been here forever. And you realize, well, wait a minute, you know, there's this whole other um, indigenous history that we need to, we really need to be utilizing to shape the way that we rethink our relationship to the land and to place and to culture and to each other. Christian, were you going to say something? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Okay, actually, yes. Um, well, I'm not sure if uh, I'm just thinking about the this question and I was um, de hecho, creo que, bueno, el conflicto que yo veo más que nada es con la poca valoración que se le tiene a los curadores del norte, ¿no? O sea, porque este centralismo siempre ha hecho como confiar más en los proyectos si está involucrado a alguien conocido de, de las, del centro, ¿no? Entonces, en, en ocasiones se demerita mucho los trabajos si no hay esta voz reconocida que en momentos dados puede llevar a cabo este como una, pues más que nada una oficialización de, de, un, de un trabajo. Entonces, de repente se, se conflictúa, ¿no? Porque son dos miradas diferentes, porque son dos, podríamos decirlo, dos idiomas diferentes. Entonces, ahí es donde realmente nosotros tenemos esta posibilidad de empezar a encaminar a los curadores eh, locales a empezar a trabajar y a profesionalizar. Eh, creo que si, no, si Kerry y Edgar no me dejan en, eh, mentir, pues, curadores en el norte eh, tenemos, pero que ya han llegado como a un, a una, un posicionamiento, pues son pocos. Y estamos hablando de que realmente pues, tenemos tantos trabajos, eh, tan, tantas personas que pueden involucrarse en esto que de repente es preocupante, ¿no? Que no se abran esas puertas. And I just want to say that we play that game too all the time, like dropping names of big artists and dropping names of, you know, we do that, we drop names of big artists to funders to get funds, and we drop names of big funders to make other people believe that we're legitimate, right? So that happens all the time. So it's, it's happening to us from the outside, but also we capitalize on it from the inside. And I do want to say that I think that there's a slight shift in some of the funders, think, certainly with the Mellon Foundation, who's yeah. like thinking in much more uh, sort of broad ways about who they're funding and why, I think to some extent, the Warhol Foundation. And I have to honestly say, you know, in the United States, the National Endowment for the Arts yes. has done a pretty good job of sustaining some of our projects. But but that 
big name dropping, like Diego says, having somebody from the outside to make us legitimate, it's not just something that happens from the outside. I mean, we, I mean, I'm speaking for myself, but we use it all the time to sort of register on people's radar by, by saying like, oh, it's not just locals involved. It's, you know, we got somebody from New York or Mexico City, so. Yeah. Carrie made me realize I didn't thank our funders when I um, introduced the panel. Thank you to the National Endowment for the Arts for this exhibition, the <laughs> Mellon Foundation, the Tama Foundation, and of course, Community Foundation of Southern New Mexico. Thank you, Carrie. I'd like to keep the funders happy. So. <laughs> I, I would like to add something too. Like when I, when I first read this question, I wrote down, I can't see the forest for the trees. Um, because up until recently, I felt that we haven't really, a lot of what we've done hasn't been noticed. Um, many of our first programs and exhibitions were, were passed along by word of mouth with punk rock Xeroxed flyers and exhibition spaces or alternative spaces that were like burnt out or haunted houses or former narco tunnels along the border. Um, but I, I, will, I will pass along this one story that when we first started the Mexicali Biennial, it was at La Casa La Tia Tina in Mexicali. And we invite, we started to invite artists from Los Angeles. And we're like, hey, we're doing the show. It's in Mexicali, it's at La Casa La Tia Tina. And then it was just crickets. So we created a logo, a letterhead, a website. And then we started inviting artists with letters saying, congratulations, we'd like to invite you to the inaugural Mexicali Biennial that's gonna be taking place, blah, blah, blah. And immediately artists started responding, sending emails, resumes, postcards, photos, asking for studio visits. And it was all in the wake of, of, of uh, you know, insight. So I think that was one way in which the, the border did kind of recontextualize what a small little burnt out house in Mexicali could actually be. Um, and then using the context of the biennial uh, to, to really rethink how binational exchanges happen um, and rethink alternative art practices that we've been able to experiment with. Thank you so much, um, everybody. I, I want to address um, a couple of questions if anybody has any, but I wanna start with Mary's question in the chat before we, we take some from um, the, the, the live audience. Mary says, my question is how can we reach the silent community? The ones who aren't proactive about art, who don't even know why they need it, or who do have opinions and interests, but don't feel they have an avenue to be welcome at or have a voice in these events or venues. In other words, who do we promote the events to? I just had a pop-up exhibit of my home studio and we only had 20 visitors who were not artists in the show after what I thought was a pretty widely um, promotion. There's a, this is just a joke, but then people can answer the question, but there's a really funny New Yorker cartoon that um, has a woman saying, our mission is to bring the arts to people who don't want the arts. So, <laughs> and sometimes I feel like that really, like, you know, and so, I mean, that's not a great answer to the question, but, you know, we've had 20 people show up to a show that we spent, you know, a year curating. And so I, I do, as an institution, I do think it's our job to develop relationships with the community and a two way kind of dialogue so that we're really understanding. I mean, not that we are going to program by, you know, whatever, like online vote or something like that, but to sort of develop relationships and, and to also show up to where people are and understand their context and invite them back and, and not expect people just to show up because it's art, but just sort of, you know, I think most of our PR, most of what happens in our space happens through actual events so whether those are educational events or lectures or school groups visiting or you know conversations all those things but but i also think most of our pr happens through relationships so you know when we're we do put things on social media but we're not a tourist spot no one's going to run into us or wander in on accident or something like that so when we have an event we do develop we do depend a lot on sort of reaching out to people whose stuff we've gone to and who's, you know, we're interested in and, you know, and that that's how people come is relationships, but. Yeah, I would, I would expand upon that as well, especially at educational institutions, take what your students say to heart. Um, we try to really think about what our students are researching, their faculty are researching, um, and then we, especially at a university art museum where we have students who are working with us, 
where do you outreach? How can we outreach to those groups? Starting a tickety tockety, uh, getting more on, you know, with working more, especially with this exhibition, with so much Instagram. We did a 30 day Instagram every day for 30 days. Um, and then, yeah, these connections that you make um, with institutions, um, other institutions. Um, yes, I meant TikTok. Um, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ortega. Um, you and got the Snapchat, you got the Snapchat in there? You, we, you know, that, they, so. the, the students talked about a Snapchat, but uh, I don't know how to use that at all. And uh, <laughs> no, but you know, I, I do think that um, really evolving as things evolve as much as you can um, and reaching out in as many venues as you can and, and trying to work in, you know, we, we put all of our posters and our postcards up in the supermarket and all the bars and all the other galleries in town. And it's just about trying all that you can on with your budget, with your staff, with your non-staff, like how far will your car go? Um, so there's a lot of different ways. And also hoping that you can, you know, writing enough grants where you can keep it for free so people can come in on their off days. We have a, um, a lactation station. Come in to breastfeed and see some art. Um, you know, give people a space like our students and, and our community members are right now, a place to just sit down and chill. Um, so various methods. I think it also has a lot to do with like the kind of programming that you have. Like if somebody feels identified with what you're doing, like, I mean, they're going to go and visit, right? If there's like a community that is constantly like, you know, trying to go to a museum and they're looking at art and they can't connect to that art for like any reason, like they're not going to come back. But if they start seeing things that they can, you know, feel reflected, like they can see their lives or their experiences reflected in what they're seeing. I feel like that's a very important way of making people, you know, like be more attracted to it. I also don't think that it's necessarily like, I mean, like, you know, like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, D definitely like as an institution or like you know like or working for like a project you of course want to make sure you spread the word and you let everybody know what's happening but also like having the burden of like converting people to like art you know like that would be great but it's also like i mean it's really not up to us to like you know have to fight that fight i believe um but um also like was mentioned right now i feel like also like programming i i had the opportunity to work um freelancing for the El Paso Museum of Art for a couple of years, uh, like three or four years ago. And I think it was kind of like the golden ages of the museum because they had a really good team that was actively working on programming outside of the exhibitions that related to people. So they started like, you know, doing like Dia de los Muertos and they started like inviting um, artists from Mexico to uh, uh, create work and, and, and uh, um, so, and, you know, they had like, you know, like parties and they invited people and they had, you know, like events for kids and they really made that place like super lively um, through this like programming, you know, like beyond just like having um, the exhibition and, you know, like an artist talk, you know, like just like, I mean, if you really want to get people to go to your places, you make them have fun, you feed them, you know, give, you know, it's, it's I mean, if, if you really want to try that hard, but, um, but I think that's very necessary as well. Yeah. Uh, yo a veces pienso que a la gente no le gusta muchas veces la verdad, ¿no? O, o confrontarse con la realidad. Y a veces el arte te, llega, te lleva a esos límites. Entonces, a veces siento, ¿no? Que si vemos una exhibición en la cual no te implica o no te confronta de esa forma, este, tienes esa, es, esa posibilidad, ¿no? O sea, y de repente vemos en exhibiciones que son de un corte eh, más eh, tradicionalista, ¿no? O un corte eh, más de, en sentido de, de, de obra plástica, que no implica mucho esa conciencia, entonces es ahí donde se medía un poquito esta cuestión. Eh, sí hay, hay, hay unas cuestiones en la comunidad que realmente a veces el poco entendimiento del arte contemporáneo o el poco conocimiento de, de los temas repercute con, con la forma en la que el, la, el público asiste ¿no? a las exhibiciones. Entonces, sí tiene mucho que ver también, el abanico tiene que ser muy amplio, realmente creo que en, nuestra, en nuestro deber tiene que ser a qué, a qué tipo de público le estás hablando, 
y cuál es el que va a recibir la, la llamada ¿no? para, para la, la exhibición en la que estés montando. Um, Ed. I, I would I would just I think this was from MD, right? The, I would say, well, congratulations, you got 20 visitors. I think it's just a different way of thinking about it. I think instead of it seeing like something that's negative, I'd be like, this is super awesome. This is positive. I'm reaching at least 20 people. We're coming out of COVID where everybody was afraid of being next to each other. Uh, and you you plant seeds and you build communities and it takes time. And I, I don't think you should you should like impose some type of ridiculous uh, expectation of something. I think it's let it grow organically. And I, I would say, congratulations, you got 20 people there. It sounds super awesome. If I, if I would have known about it, I would I would have been there also. So I don't, I don't, don't take it as a negative. I think just continue and um, things will happen organically. I think if there's sincerity and, you know, dedication and honesty, I think you, know, you don't think of it as a negative. It's, it's, a, it's a positive challenge. Is there something you want to add, Josie? You know, I think as a public museum, um, we're really lucky to be funded by the city of Albuquerque. And so our success is not necessarily measured by attendance, um, which is such a liberating thing um, because we know that if we don't get 500 visitors to see, you know, a certain exhibition, you know, one of the exhibitions that we put on that I thought was going to be an absolute blockbuster. I was just so excited. Um, we were able to host um, 30 Americans, which is just an amazing contemporary African-American art, uh, contemporary art exhibition. And it wasn't that highly attended. And I don't, I mean, maybe it was because it was right after COVID, you know, all of these different things. But at the end of the day, I was so glad that we were able to bring that here and that we were able to engage with the aspects of our African-American community that we could, even though it wasn't the blockbuster that I imagined or, or hoped it would be. Um, and so I think there are projects that are still worth doing, even if you know that you're not gonna have those big audiences or the fancy write-ups and hyperallergic or whatever, you know, like like there's still projects that are, that are, that, That, that are about a, a broader thinking and the way that we're engaging with the world and, and bringing artists in to participate in that dialogue. And again, I acknowledge my privilege of having funding. So I'm not trying to say <laughs> that what's already been said, I'm not trying to negate that at all. And, and a lot of people do live in a world where if you don't bring in visitors, you don't get the funding. Yeah, which, which makes it very... Um... Very complicated. Were you going to say something, Marisa? Oh, no, no, no. I was going to I was gonna ask if anyone in the audience here had any questions. Were there other Zoom questions? Just a comment from Motoko Furuhashi. This exhibition was truly amazing, and I really hope it will travel to different parts of the country or the world. Us too. <laughs> yeah, we're, we are working on that. We are uh, working on a traveling package, right, Manuel? And um, we are hoping that this exhibition will travel um, and could potentially have additions in other places that it might go. And um, thinking about artists all over who are part, can be part of the conversation that we have within this exhibition. Um, I'll, I would like to say just one more thing on the last conversation we were having, which is I also think it's a privilege to be able to have um, exhibitions that make you happy, but supporting your, it sounds like you're supporting your community. And again, I am always like thinking about who's here and who walks through these doors. And I also really love seeing work and if if i can make a show that i believe other people will want to work walk through and they'll want to take part in a panel like this and i get to hear these kind of conversations i've got to imagine that you know other people want to hear it too on some level and you just have to do it because you can't not do it um for your community and for, and potentially for yourself if you know you really if yourself is the, the community um, Yeah. 
I, I just wanted to um, add to what you were saying about including other people in the dialogue. For us, it was really important to think about this idea of absolution when we were putting together the show and ways in which contemporary artists can address historic pieces. So the hope is for the exhibition to travel. The hope is to engage other artists in other centers um, to think about maybe local historic collections in relation to these ideas around um, devotion. So yes, we're working on it. Hopefully it, it, it will work out. But any more questions from, from our Zoom guests or any last comments that we want to add? Yeah, go ahead, Paula. I, I'm wondering if you feel that your audience is of a particular political party and if there is a desire to, to have political conversations that, again, I appreciated that question about like reckonings within institutions and whether or not there's some aspect to where you are reaching out in ways that to party in, a, in this hyper political moment that's really divisive, like how, how you might deal with that. If you understand, I don't think I said that so well, but maybe you, you get at what I'm trying to ask. I get you, Paula, but, and it's really interesting because um, I don't wanna exaggerate this, but I do wanna say this. I think, you know, in El Paso, I'm just gonna speak for El Paso, not for Juarez or Las Cruces, but in El Paso, you know, we've spoken a lot in the past 10 years about the fact that we live in this sort of interesting bubble of tolerance. And again, I don't wanna exaggerate that. However, you know, even though El Paso is largely democratic, you will see, you know, democratic and Republican people being in projects together and having conversations together. You know, when we did that border tuner project, our mayor at the time was a Republican, but came up and talked about the importance of our two border cities being connected and the history of, you know, people in both cities having friendships and relationships and language and business relationships across borders. And, you know, I think, um, um, you know, I'm from Chicago originally, so I was traveling back and forth a lot, um, you know, during the, you know, 2016 and 2020 election cycles. And uh, it was a shock to me every time to see that polarization when I got to a place like Chicago, you know, uh, and then to come back to El Paso and feel that that was somewhat muted. And, and again, that could very easily be exaggerated, but I think that we are not necessarily in El Paso operating in that hyper-political environment that much of the country is operating in, even though, you know, we certainly felt that tremendous wave of immigrants, particularly in 2019, we're very involved, many of us like hands-on in, you know, uh, you know, feeding people and sheltering people and, you know, the unaccompanied minors in our community and the, uh, you know, the militarization of the border. The conversation at the moment, I would say, is still largely tolerant, which is, I think, a very, very special thing about that place for me. So, yeah. Um, we don't have that luxury in Albuquerque. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we have a, just to give you an example. Hi, Paula. It's great to see you. Um, we have a in-house curated exhibition of the collections on wit, humor, and satire, um, which was very much embedded in my research. And we literally have had comments like, this is a communist promoting exhibition. And so um, like we have the gamut here and there are people who are Hispanic that you know think that they're not Mexican and there are people who are you know, all over the place in terms of politic politics and, and racial identity. And, um, but what's fortunate is that we're in a moment right now where our staff is really supportive about pushing against those ideas in different ways. Like a few years ago, we had this huge debate about whether or not the history collection should collect um, artifacts or, or objects from the Deb Holland campaign. And at the time, it was sort of mind blowing, like, of course we should, why wouldn't we collect that? But it was actually a discussion. And so, you know, there's, there's much more of a, um, there used to be, and I think this is changing rapidly in teaching and in museums, there used to be this idea that we have to be objective, that we have to not take sides, that we have to always be in the middle. And I think that that, because of the 
polarized world that we're in now and because many of us on the museum staff don't think that there are two equal sides um that's shifting and that's changing and so i feel really lucky thank goodness i mean we'll see what the next mayoral uh you know candidate is or who it is i mean and for us it could change it immediately like if we have a mayor that feels like we shouldn't be doing certain things it could get difficult for us so um it is interesting to be part of a political system and still be doing this kind of cultural work um, and pushing against those boundaries of of what what the politics are inherently embedded in, in what we do. And if I can add something to that, we are here, we put together an exhibition that it's also highly political. And I think that was something that I really had in mind in thinking about the artists and the conversations they were gonna have. For me, it was important to offer artists a large, expanse of research so I knew they were coming from different directions so it is important to understand the the importance of the um, the Christian or the Catholic Church in relation to small communities in the ways in which they create community but that's not to absolve them from the legacy of violence they belong to and I feel like like sort of creating a point where you offer different perspectives um, allows for a much richer conversation as opposed to one side or, or the other. Not to say that, that, um, that you are allowing for this hateful voices to take place. It's simply that many, many, and most of the times, the histories are so much more nuanced. And, um, and, and, and there's art that, and, and that's the beauty about art, right? That, is, that it allows for that nuance to take place. It's just a matter of how um, and that takes place. I'll also say in this exhibition, Dr. Ortega, you, you had us have conversations with so many community members as part of this exhibition of so many different ages from the pieces that integrate our, our student stories into them with the Viches family to the 327 children who made retablos. And throughout those pieces and through uh, and then into the threads in the contemporary artist and the historical collection, you see so many conversations that we believe are socially integral to party lines right now that have been happening for 150, 200 years. Right, these these pieces from 1850s, and then some of the kids from 2022. These conversations are cyclical, and they're they're so that's and that it, they're so important to have. But there are so there's so many conversations that you see happening that I think you've really pulled out within this curation. Thank you, Ed. You were going to say something. Just um, just gonna give a quick example of a curatorial project we, we worked on back in 2016 when just things just went wrong. Uh, we, we created, a, right before the 2016 election, we did a, a basically an art propaganda show that was very left-leaning, showing artwork, uh, political artwork that was very leaning towards a very liberal democratic kind of position. The elections happen, Donald Trump gets elected, and in the front window of the Fine Art Complex in Tempe, Arizona, where the exhibition was, we had Robbie Canal posters that were basically saying, showing the picture of Trump, um, saying how when, when Mexico sends its people, it sends its rapists and, and criminals. Uh, and on the other, it was bully culprit. Um, and then that quote, and it was a red, white, and black wall of Robbie Canal posters that were very critical of Trump. Trump gets elected the very next day. The gallery gets bomb threats. Um, threats on the lives of the gallerists. Uh, the gallery was vandalized. Windows were trying were were um, broken because our left leaning liberal political propaganda show was labeled alt right white supremacist, uh, and we were all racists that were supporting this kind of really horrible agenda. And so I, I think I've learned to uh, um, you know consider the, the the precise opposite and and uh, with the understanding that when political shows happen, um, messaging and being able to take back the narrative is really important because 
things can go wrong. And I think that, um, you know, that's a that's a lesson that I've learned and my fellow curators, Luisa Hernandez and my, my wife, April Lillard, learned. Because what we were trying to do was understood completely the opposite. Uh, and there were consequences to that, too. Very interesting. Um, Christian, you want to add anything else? Right. Um, in reality, I think in order to finish, I think part of what you mentioned with our work of process, I haven't had the pleasure of seeing the exhibition. I think I'll give it a turn in the next week to be able to see the work that many artists are recognized in the work that they're participating in. Simplemente, pues, en cuanto puedan y, y el público de tanto de, de las cruces y al burger que puedan citarnos, con gusto aquí está el museo para recibirlos. Eh, y pues, bueno, <ríe> la verdad, me quedo también pensando y, y, y me gustaría también este, comentarles, ¿no? De la exhibición y diferentes formas en las que se, se dialogan y se puede este, llevar a cabo procesos con, con asociaciones civiles o en este caso, ¿no? que es, es un proyecto que se llevan a cabo con, con la comunidad migrante que estuvo estos dos años varada en, en Ciudad Juárez esperando el asilo y pues parte de las piezas que se muestran es esta, ¿no? es esta espera en, en el que se llevó a cabo un proceso de integración y de sanación a partir del bordado entonces, los bordados que vamos, se, se van a mostrar en, en, en esta exhibición, eh, pues son relatos, ¿no? Es un relato eh, de, de un sueño que pues, igual y al final pues, resulta ser otra cosa, ¿no? También el momento de cruzar, pues le continúa esta, esta travesía, pero de otra forma, ¿no? Entonces, también eso es parte del de, de contexto en el que se vive con, cuando ves estas historias. Entonces, parte de la exhibición, pues trata de de contextualizar este, este pequeño paso. Perfecto, muchas gracias. Anybody want to add anything else before we go? I just wanted to add, you know, tag, tagging, kind of bringing all of the ideas back to Paula's question in this understanding that museums aren't neutral spaces. Like, even if we present multiple perspectives and we try to create these incredibly nuanced you know conversations right. it's not neutral like there's always we're, we're pushing ideas in different directions and I think that we have to take that responsibility really seriously because it's part of our um, responsibility to our communities I mean and it, it's it's important that we we have an understanding of that and I think for so long especially institutions like mine you know, there was this place of neutrality or objectivity. And, and I think that's, that's no longer the case. Thank you, Josie. Anybody else before we go? UAM.nmsu.edu for all of our upcoming programming and other conversations like this, hopefully. Yes, and hopefully we get to see you in person. Um, during Nazarene by Luis Buñuel, which we're excited about, about that. Thank you to all our participants. Thank you, everybody, the museum and NMSU Art Museum. Thank you for facilitating this rare and important conversations. And um, thank you, everybody, for joining the, uh, who join us from all over the place on Zoom. Thank you, um, everybody. And again, this is going to be recorded and it's going to be available on the website. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And everybody have a wonderful evening. Thanks. Gracias. Adios. Bye.